I just wanted to say thanks to the developers, you know who you are and where you work, who helped me make these videos. Let's begin with part two of Walking the Walk for Valhalla. We're going to talk about art, we're going to talk about gameplay, we're going to talk about AI, all the architecture that's built into making an open world game, as well as a lot of Viking history. Whoop, hit the wrong button. I want to talk about the fortress making that the Vikings actually did. While this isn't one of them, it is one of my favorite locations in the game for some odd reason, and it just reminded me of wanting to talk about this. Circular fortresses had moats that were over 15 feet wide. They had massive ramparts to them, and they were in a perfect circle with a north, east, south, and west gate so that they could get out at exactly or or near exactly wherever they were being attacked. There was always a way for them to leave. It was a highly intelligent way of building these. And historians using all kinds of technology now have identified five or six of these sort of rim cathedrals, these rim castles. I hit the wrong button. Well, hey, you can see what the uh, GPU is doing. We're in, we're in pretty good shape. Sorry, right, I didn't even know what button I had hit there. But you see these rim fortresses, they set it up, but they also used in some way sort of like a pie cut into fourths. They would also have barracks on each one of the corners as well. And there's some very good remnants of some of these bases where you could see exactly how they put these together with their ideas. Their ideas, of course, based around not only making sure that they're safe inside, but a mobility, the ability to be flexible in battle. There wasn't just this spot on top of a hill where they had to wait and everybody was attacking them. They were always very intelligent in where they built and what they took over. And the histories are filled with times where the Vikings just said, you know what, screw it, and left to fight another day. They were very open about that. You may be wondering while playing open world games why weather systems come and go so quickly, and so too do the day-night cycles. Most of the time, developers consistently have to truncate down the size of the game world. For instance, the landmass here for England, the devs compressed it down to a little more than an hour, or an hour and a half to walk across or go by boat. The day-night cycle is usually somewhat based on the same exact scale, meaning the weather changes in a compressed format and time frame as well as do the day and night. Why should or why does that matter? Variety and speed of travel. Those are calculated to make sure that the player sees a number of weathers and times of days that are in somewhat reminiscent or connected to the length of their trip. It's a sound system, actually. While mods are usually made to change time frames in games, it's not a change that's frivolous to the developers, and it works to keep gamers immersed in a world. They get that consistent change, and it also lets missions that require a time of day or time of night to be easier to engage with by the gamer more quickly without always having to pass time. Many times it's there so that a person can go from one quest to another, and when a time-specific quest is there, it's just available to them. Scale's important, and when the devs do this, and they did their own discovery tour and looked out and saw these sheer scale locations, they realized that it wasn't just the climbing and the leaping and the verticality of the environments that was going to matter. It was also making sure that the world and the people themselves looked and acted like they were accustomed to to those locations. This also resulted in them making sure that the characters understood pathing, dress in some locations, as well as characterization that we see in some of the later places. And the developers just wanted to replicate that and replicate the sense of scale that a natural person living here would see. And these people living in these small inlets would look to the right or to the left and instantly it was a sheer wall next to them, a sheer wall of just utter size. And that feeling of being small next to nature is something that is replicated quite well in Valhalla and really is just a natural ex extension of the location itself and the people who live there. While climbing here, I do want to point out something. So AC's original creative director while creating the game stated that he was sorry for the towers in games, that he felt in some way that he had caused that mechanic. And I get it. AC was one of the first to popularize that kind of movement, I think. But I can't say that makes it anything that you should really apologize for. The mechanic itself is actually fine. Utilizing it in different ways is how games augment and dynamically adjust as players become familiar with something. The complaint is the continued same use that you saw in these games. It didn't really switch it up until these last couple titles. Traveling upwards to find a goal is really as old as time, from missed old stories to board. What the hell? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I actually saw somebody get hit by an elk one time. It broke his arm, his leg, and his his pelvis, I believe. You know, you're talking 1,200 pounds of angry steer. This is obviously AI gone wrong here. Oh, right, AI is being chased, I see. So this is the chase 
paradigm that they've sort of built into the AI itself. Anyway, what I was saying about climbing is that from old myths to old stories to board games to games with kids climbing monkey bars, I'm going to try to get this guy. Unfogging that world and, you know, sort of giving characters more motivation for what they see is not bad. However, there are really hundreds of other ways to merge that into the elements of the game and into the game itself. Perhaps the bird, maybe another point of contention in the games, uh, could be used from the top of the tower, some other controlled mechanism. Who knows? So I'm going to jump forward here a bit so you guys can see this medicine woman character. The Vikings had no actual overall religious uh, group that led them. They did have people such as Valka, who's a vulva, who's basically a mystic woman. They did have those characters, but they actually had their own very personal way of dealing with religion, which was also one of the most difficult parts for people when they wanted to convert them to Christianity. Because the Vikings were like, hey, if it works... We'll go with that, but it didn't mean they would stop something else. And this caused issues for years. They Somebody would be like, hey, man, we want to go ahead and Christian you. They'd see it worked out in some battle somewhere, and they're like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that. But then they would still be doing sacrifices of animals. They would still be doing their normal expe expected stuff. And a lot of difficulty involved getting them to convert. It was just really difficult. One of the best stories involves a Viking lord who was asked to convert. He was interested but asked, well, what about my ancestors? Are they in heaven? And the priest said, no, they didn't believe, so they're not there. The Lord, without missing a beat, basically said, I would rather live with my ancestors around me and not anger them than be without them. And there was a lot of attempts, things like saying that the hammer was just a f upside down cross and that you were just wearing the cross wrong. Any kind of similarities were used to try to, try to meet them and put them together. Now, the Volvo's hut here and any building in the game are all checked and hand placed from and with items from the designers. If you look, they also have small environmental storytelling devices in them. They'll outfit the homes with specialty items that you won't really see anywhere else. This lodges that location into your memory as special, even aside from the character who you meet there. Then they also make sure that the locations look like they have a shared heritage as well, shared pieces of art or designs. So sometimes a game may have a place where a tribal sign is in one place and then half of that sign is in another location where a higher level character resides or someone who might have more or less knowledge of that writing in particular or art in particular. You see that in Far Cry Primal as well as a really good piece to show you environmental storytelling done just by a little simple bit of art design. To continue this discussion about spirituality just for a second, ancestral worship, like I said, was incredibly important to the Vikings. Ubisoft made use of that in the story and some choices as well, and I applaud them for it. They had a full belief that these ancestors were just unruly, and you would have to continually make sure to bring them up. You would have to tell them in stories, tell about their deeds, or they would come out and attack you. So this ancestral worship is then overlaid on top of their own group of gods, and then when you have Christianity, also put into there, or as, as well as Islam, you have these different religions coming together and you have a very difficult time because instead of somebody who's dogmatically against something, the Vikings were in a way dogmatically flexible, which sounds like it can't be possible, but there you have it. I like this character. I love the knotted and knitted different rolls of cord that she has, as well as what looks like some <laughs> rummy tile cubes on the side of her face as well. Drink up, sucker. So I jumped forward to one of the main attacks and uh, I'm going to fight this main guy that you sort of go through Norway looking for prior to your, your move out of the location. When it comes to this fight, I want to bring up the mocapping. So a lot of difficulty was handled, I would say, in a, in a fairly smart way with the mocapping for this game. They ended up having some professionals who sort of knew what they were doing with weapons, and they have them doing the mocapping that you would expect, that kind of stuff. They did a pretty good job, from what I understand, explaining to people what they were seeing, because one of the difficulties with mocapping that you hear a lot of people have is the inability for them to sort of identify with the location or the situation that's actually occurring. And it seemed to me that a lot of times when you would hear about mocap, you would sort of see this video where a guy was just standing by himself swinging a sword and it didn't make a lot of sense. It didn't have a lot of impact, didn't have a lot of feel. From what I understand by the way that Ubisoft handled this one in particular, if not also Odyssey, was a bit more hands-on and a little bit more feedback to the characters on what they are seeing, what they're doing. That really is something that's vital for the players who are jumping in and taking on these characters so that they can feel a part of whatever it is that's going to be up on a digital display sometime later for a person to play. And I like the rune stones that come out of him when he does his specials, when you hit him. It's so awesome. Watch this. I think he'll throw me. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I think at some point he actually... Ooh, got by you. 
I, at one point, he actually uh, throws an enemy at me or can throw enemies. I think it's this guy. Oh, nope. Getting his axes back. Double handed, double bladed axes were not very well known in Viking traditions. They definitely did one handed axes and they did have double bladed or sorry, they did have double handed axes at one time. But the typical mm, the typical double bladed axe is not something that they were actually using. And I don't think it's shown up in any historical data. I think it just is one of those things where somebody said, hey, man, two axes are better than one. They certainly did have blades on the end of some axes, like a sort of a, a pull kind of thing where they could pull an enemy's off. Oh, my God, he's huge. Oh, I forgot this. I oh, mean, I totally forgot this part. I love the idea that that's what you're fighting right now is a dude who's basically a berserker, a berserker leader with all of his items. Oh, and the, yes, I forgot this. He tries to kill him, doesn't he? And that didn't work. That dude's screwed. But you see this guy with a bunch of the bear talons on his chest. And my assumption is that that is what all of this is supposed to indicate. If somebody's watching and they're like, oh, no, it was oh, it was actually for sure a thing. And they mentioned it in the narrative. I might have missed that. This guy's actually throwing human bodies at me. That's a, ooh, dodge. He just, wow, man. There we go. Bye. Right, I'm just going to plop him right in the dick. You're out. So if you'll bear with me here, I'm going to slow this down a little bit and talk you through some of the stuff that I noticed in the fight. Like, for example, that first rune that appears above his head actually means thorn or troll. It sort of means both things in the Viking runic script. But I love how that shows up whenever he does that particular attack. You sort of get that idea of him as this particular berserker character. Also, Eivor uses a, a particular cant on the bow, which is sort of holding it at a slightly different degree so that you can see more of whatever you're aiming at versus the actual heft of the bow, which is one of the things that can actually happen. When you're shooting a bow, if you're holding it particularly straight, it will actually be a little bit harder to see. So a lot of people actually hold it at this cant. Oh, I missed him. I didn't even see that. Also, when you see as I switch positions and do the push off speed, that move doesn't require a particular foot to be on the ground. And I love how it pivots when he does. I just dig this spin itself. Their animation isn't perfect, but if you look, you can see he actually lifts his lead foot to speed up on a spin like you would see an ice skater do. Then right before impact, he touches down, uses that rear leg to keep the rotation going instead of planting it as if he was going to stab or push a character. Speaking of ice skating, I love that the enemy just holds Ivor up and you instead of seeing him standing ramrod straight, he realistically pulls Avar closer to him to keep that weight between his feet, his ankles, and Avor. Here's the kicker though. If you've ever headbutted somebody, the first thing you learn is to never hit them in the face or forehead. I love that he also slightly adjusts his head when he headbutts Avor. Just and twist. Awesome. Say what you will about Ubisoft's animations, but a lot of this stuff is fairly well done, like when he lands on his shoulders and then rolls up and over just like a body uncoils, because that is actually what a human body does. Is if you get that roll, unless you tightly bound yourself into the roll, you actually will push out. That's the body's desire to sort of straighten back out. The only really time you'll ever see somebody curve in towards, towards themselves is a severe amount of brain damage. There's various different ways you can see what type of brain damage ha somebody has, the bending of the wrists or the curving up into the fetal uh, position, depending on what part of their brain has been damaged. This snow, the way everybody looks, and I get it that he's going the other way. It looks odd. And then you see him running for these double axes. I just think it's really well done. Now, again, we're slowing it down. So you do see those animation shifts and the blending and how everything happens, but there's a lot of storytelling that they are trying to get in here. And as I stated, I'm not in love with Valhalla, but I certainly don't have a particular issue with these kind of things. Even the idea of them celebrating behind and around them during this ritual battle, which is something that they fully believed in. They had no issues whatsoever. Also, his double swipe, that first swipe at the initial arrow and then the double swipe to also sweep it to the side is so well done. And that double jump. I love that when I roll out, you can actually see just that roll into the duck, quick twist, protect the bow, protect the arrow to make sure that the arrow doesn't get smashed and then hit him with that axe. Of course, as we all know, one hit with a double axe probably kill you, but whatever. Last thing I want to point out is that Ubisoft has made sure that the emitters on all of the weapons actually follow the weapon if there's blood on it. So if a character hits another character and blood comes off, you'll actually see that blood trail along as the weapon moves or chambers into another move. So it's actually correct in the way a lot of that blood flows and moves around. 
Last but not least, watch when the axe hits the ground. He actually has to reverse his wrist and move the axe so that the back end faces away from him so he can swing it accurately and correctly in regards to his body and his wrist. That's just really good. There's no cheating that's involved in that particular moment other than a little bit of that slide where he loosens his grip and you see the axe slide down his hand more towards the head. There's a little bit of a cheating there that wouldn't necessarily be possible with the weight and how it was done, but still... Hey, like I said, we can complain about a lot of things, but there's some cool stuff going on there. Oh, and yes, the the proverbial vision quest for each character that you kill. And this is, of course, when Odin shows up missing that eye. And your connection to Odin sort of becomes a thing, becomes more well-known for each of these that go off. Also with Odin, I do like that he's such a mysterious figure. You see the ravens, you see him showing up, but he's always mysterious. He's one of those characters that you're like, is he on my side? Is he not on my side? Does he know me? Does he not know me? Obviously he knows me, but what exactly is happening? And each one of these characters decrying their death, indicating that you're the cause of all the problems is pretty good foreshadowing. All for this? Nah. The coward father is empty to sacrifice. Heed the price of our war was kissed. The harvest of three dead generations. All their names are known. It all means nothing. No. My plan will not be forgotten! I fought as I did. As hard as I did to survive, for I know what awaits us in the end. Only darkness. <laughs> so I wanted to fast forward us to these guys leaving and why I found this just such a cool choice. So Sigurd and you, you come together, you've decided that your own king has given up his reign to another king who's taken over. And Sigurd, of course, it's his father. He's like, I want to go. I don't want to be here. I want to start out in a new world. And you get to choose if you take the resources from this current camp with you into England or if you go with just no connections whatsoever. And I think this was a, a perfect choice that maybe doesn't feel as impactful as people wanted, but is actually exactly, it pays off exactly how I was hoping. And that's that you can take the stuff with you and you can take that money and worsen that situation with this current leader here, or you can leave it. And pretty much every single time, choose to leave it. I like the idea that Sigurd brings up and he's like, I don't want to befoul the, the ordeal, the overall feeling between my father and myself more than it already is because he's seen that Sigurd has actually seen a ton of war. He is older than you and he did save you, but he wants to get away from this. He doesn't have an issue with raiding and that kind of stuff, but that internal civil war and the internal back and forth of leadership absolutely bothers that character. And this is something that when you look at characters who's written well and who's not in video games, Ken Levine's talk about it many characters have talked about it but player driven replayable narratives that ability to sort of do a loop here it's not a loop so i don't want to push it that far but i want to say that it it's the beginning of the way choices are made and some of these choices may seem huge and they may be something where you're like oh this will be a big deal and maybe it's not but when you take into account the way the vikings lived you don't have to make it a big deal it's just a deal and so he says, you know, I don't want this to be an assault on my father. It's time of renewal. That is something that they actually believed in. For example, as I already brought up, if a, if a fortress or location was untenable, it was something that they couldn't hold on to, they would leave to renew themselves, to sort of refresh and get out of the constant uh, dregs, the constant terror that they were always in and that they faced quite well. But at times they weren't stupid. They knew. And so the idea of getting these people together that wants to go, that wants to take the chance with you guys is awesome. Now, this also does sort of give you the first dichotomy of how leadership is going to go. It's very difficult to not notice that it's you three with Dag over on the side. And in fact, the husband and wife aren't necessarily as in love as you might assume. This is something that happens with Vikings in particular, where they would leave to two, three, four, five, six years and go to another location. You find out that he's been gone for a while. He comes back and the wife isn't necessarily as much into him returning as you would assume, which is foreshadowing for some stuff that comes up later. 
it's not a mistake that they threw that in there. And you can see that pyramid of leadership, which if you understand how leadership works is not actually as solid as most people think. Usually three leaders is a disaster. It's just like kids in a playground. It usually falls apart at some point, especially if it's three people and not three groups. Sometimes three groups is actually something that you want here. It's not. I want to talk to you guys about something technical. So see this easy little swing there? Boom. You would think that was easy to do, wouldn't you? It isn't. One of the things that the developers have talked about for Assassin's Creed is their ability to use the engine itself, the Anvil engine, to draw on the game world. If they want to put a stream in the game, they can do so very easily. Anybody can do this. That's what I think is awesome. So that means an artist can do it. The lead can sit down and do it. Anybody can do it. And they can sort of draw out locations. And the Anvil engine will understand how to handle the geometry to a basic level and many other parts of the game world, including rivers and where water is going to flow into them. Your zip lines are the worst. Zip lines, it is hilarious to see how difficult it is to get a zip line to work. They have to make sure the zip line is not too angled or the character's animations won't work. It has to be up enough so that the actual physicality makes sense and that the character's inertia and movement forward makes sense. And there is an entire video about making the lands of, I believe it was Odyssey, maybe it was Origins. They that you can watch on GDC. I love the GDC videos and they talk about nothing more than the difficulty of zip lines. And I don't mean the entire talk about is about that. I mean that it is that difficult that just by a simple change, you can make things not work at all. Whether somebody puts a tree in front of a zip line or they put it up too high. And I just think that that's awesome. It's just, it's one of those parts that we all joke about zip lines all the time. We do. We joke about zip lines. We joke about synchro and how that happens on the tall locations. We talk about all these things. And if you just watch a GDC, I bet you, you will take a good fresh perspective, especially on some of the stuff that you think is quite easy. That is a disaster. There was a Twitch conversation where a dev said, tell some secrets that no one knows. And by the end of the tweet list, by the end of all these people commenting, the one thing that no one understood was how hard doors are. Doors are insanely difficult to get to work right and make sure that people can get through them and that things don't go dramatically wrong. So this, of course, is that last moment with father and son coming together and the son saying, listen, I'm going to go ahead and just leave. And them talking about victories, who's more, who's more victorious. And this shows Sigurd's ability to sort of lead on his own, stand on his own two feet, and also the ability for him to understand that by standing on his own two feet, it doesn't mean he has to stand on his, the shoulders of his father. His father can stay behind. And his father also agrees with that by telling Eivor, you know, you watch over him, be, be sort of his faith, be sort of the, the character that, uh, that helps him in the difficult times, which is a major sticking point in this story, not sticking point in a bad way, but is a sticky part of the story that I think actually holds true pretty much all the way throughout it. And finally, we're leaving. We're going to jump in here. People have got their oars ready. They've got all of their shields out. And now we're going to go and find a home for these characters. And this is actually where I think this talk gets even more interesting because not only where they chose to live, but how they went about it is actually very, very cool. And taking Dag with you is one of those moments where I know a lot of gamers, we talked and they were like, why would you take that shitbird with you? And it's like, listen, man, these guys were fighters. They were fighters who saw death very often. And so the idea that two people may argue is not what it is in the, the real world that we're in now. And the idea that two people could argue, could fight over stuff and still defend each other the very next day and fight it out the day after that and then be friends the very next day and drink together is not unknown. And it's something that you see even in militaries now where you hear about that in military groups, uh, you know, the army, two friends in the army, but they also get in fist fights or they also, you know, they're constantly at each other's throats. But when shit matters, you know, they're on it. And yeah, I'm going to complain about this just like I did in Origins. I just think that the ships move a little too fast. Obviously, this is completely unrealistic for how fast it's moving, and I get that. But at the same time, I think I, we don't need to see that. That looks like it's popping wheelies. <laughs> There's something about those ships. And the moment it shows up in Origins, I remember just I was moving around in Origins going like, man, it's going to it's gonna be hard because this is going to bother me all the time. So here now we jump into the Animus. And here now we jump out of the Animus. The animus that starts up in this first section has you walking around with characters in the modern day trying to figure out the connection with Eivor. I find this overall, I, I don't have any issues with the animus, but I don't think I can tell you anything about the animus that you didn't already know. It does connect some bits of history, but I don't think it's that interesting to show 
This is a great introduction to the location. They had to decide how is it that they're going to separate this land from the original land? How are they going to make it look different so that gamers really did feel such a feeling of being an uh, explorer? It can't just be snow, right? It has to be everything. What does the sun look like here where it looks like it might be in a completely different place and location, latitude, longitude, that type of thing? How long is the day here versus somewhere else at this particular time frame? All that kind of stuff is going to matter in how they play out England and how they go about creating it. They also had to identify the palettes of color that I talked about earlier that helps the gamer in differentiating the locations via a couple factors, including that color as well as geography and ecology. I do want to point out that while well, these guys are just hauling ass up the river, Viking boats were able to travel at incredible speeds depending on the type. And while sails did come at a later time, their speed on water was factored into every single decision th that they made, how they attacked, who they attacked, and which part that they were going to actually stop at. I do want to point out also the water foam in these locations and time frames. Foam is one of the most difficult things to get right. And back when Origins was being made and Odyssey was being pre-made and decided upon, the devs were trying to hit it just right to get the foam to not only be at the edge of the water, but coil up and around rocks and along the bottoms of the boats. They finally settled on an excellent middle ground that looks good, but isn't really computationally hugely expensive. I think it looks great, although it's only really showed up in these last three titles. Now, this part, as they travel up the river, mimics the way the Vikings really went. All the ships wouldn't actually land at one particular spot. Many times they'd enter a river and then split up or stop in different places. We see Sigurd and Eivor continue on while Sigurd's wife goes to a different spot. This is a great presentation for the gamer and understanding the differences of these characters and also giving you a place to look back and say, I'm going to go to those spots. Where the Vikings came from, remember, 70 percent forest. So much of their myths consistently involved its dangers and then coming here, seeing these differences, the changes of the geography, the sloping hills. To a Viking, this place had to have looked like it was begging to be brought to heel. Historians have also suggested it's possible that the world tree was actually more of a symbolic map of the Vikings' own land with a massive forest separating most of the people into tribes, sort of like the world tree branches in the different realms. And then coming here and seeing all these interactions, and while some people have traveled here before, all of these new characters, what they see and what they notice is hilarious. Just listen to some of this. I believe Ubisoft does a very good job in the interactions, especially here at first, where he's like, what are they doing? And Eivor calls it ritual drowning. If that's not perfect, I mean, that is what it is. That's exactly what it is. But the words that are spoken, the way he says that is, it, it, he, he didn't say baptism first, right? He didn't say this, uh, ritual drowning. It's just such a, you're just like, wow, because these guys also had a ton of different myths around water and the Leviathans and all that kind of stuff. So it's just very cool. And then going past all these locations and sort of identifying in their own head if any of these are worth stopping at. And once they do find one, sort of going like, okay, this is what we're going to do. But they decide to they decide to get settled first. And you can see this lived-in world where the characters are going about their day, but you also see these guys skirting beside them. Now, understanding this, a horse can travel a good deal of distance at a, a, a that won't kill them. They can travel a good deal of distance across land, especially if they have a light rider and not a lot of equipment or weaponry. What you see though, is these guys ability to use boats and travel and be mobile from spot to spot at such an insane track. Some of the ways that they moved blew historians away when they were reading some of the mysteries of how these guys went from, you know, location to location, how they took down different abbeys at one location and were just very soon seen somewhere else. And even the tracking of some of the heroes themselves, where those heroes were moving and their ability to travel quickly in the boat. One of the reasons why a lot of people were always questioning, how is it that these Vikings show up and they do so well with such small groups of people? One thing to remember is that the largest groups of Vikings ever, like the heathen army, has been estimated in the low, not tens of thousands, but within the high thousands, and also as low as a thousand. But even if you say high, that is still less people than sometimes some of the bigger armies would be able to field in massive battles in one arm, one battle, not just their entire army. That is nuts. The reason why they did so well is because these guys were hardened in a way that a lot of other at this time nations were not doing, which is where they would have to conscript people or they would have their militias that we certainly do see. But for the Vikings, it was what they were doing all the time. I love this water here. It's very cool.
Ubisoft has been open about how they generate water, using a number of FFT frequencies to generate waves on a surface, lower for larger waves and higher for smaller waves. Assassin's Creed 3 had only two layers of noise. Assassin's Creed Black Flag had three, but one of those didn't impact the ships itself. And in these further games, they use four, with all of them impacting the physics. They then combine that with four types and colors of water, identifying slow moving water where organic materials would sit and maybe have a tendency to turn water green or brackish. They have brown for dirt and sediment. And for water away from shores, they actually use checks for transparency and depth and reflection to get that nice blue. Then they run a dampening filter along all the edges of the water so that near up on edges or on shores, it actually reduces those waves. It's crazy to think that what we see as water of various different colors has so much calculation going on. With that information already logged, they do have to identify what plants might be organically breaking down in waters and how they were going to put all these plants in. They've chosen 80 different plants and flowering types to use in Valhalla, but they're also very strict on identifying that to the Vikings and anyone who really followed the more heathen ways, plants, animals are going to matter more. And you actually see that in the storytelling right here when you look up on that hill. You start to see the trees as characters, and this is something that the developer wanted to show, but it's also something that does mimic their lifestyle, which is nature and the, the overall belief that's, that they had. It should not be far. Good. Like the tree on the hill, visible and noted when you destroy the chain on that guard post, it's a subtle bit of storytelling, like a secret character in the crowd of a time travel movie, where only by going back and researching and rewatching do you notice that they're even there. It elevates nature subconsciously to the level that the Vikings themselves felt that it was, each level a little bit more and more. While the developers always know that gamers are not Vikings, they do want them to feel like the character that they're seeing the world through feels and realizes that they're in a realistic setting. Perspective adjustments are a huge thing in video games. Sometimes a statue is larger than it should be, or a window's wider, or the steps in Skyrim wick around the entirety of a mountain as a perfect, long experience to soak into the gamer's brain through the experiences and visions of the character. They also wanted nature to be a character here, which we see later when you go to the main village and the central symbol in the center of the village is a tree. Milestones like that then become cornerstones to feeling real, to feeling alive. We already know that the real world exists. Developers don't care about that. They want to try to make you believe in the fantasy world, or at the very least, that the characters that you are playing do. And this part here is really excellent direction for a game, this cutscene. Speaking of characters, let's you listen to Eivor and Sigurd and Dag argue back and forth like an old book club. You see Sigurd and Dag, their relationship, that of a commander, and really an unquestioning second in command. But now, in somewhat way, replaced by Eivor, the player, who's sort of in the middle, which is where all the action is in narrative. But Dag commenting, and then Eivor, and then Sigurd backing up Dag's comment with a slight teasing of Eivor, you understand all their relationships in a short moment contained within the cutscene as you enter the main spot. You don't need an exposition dump to understand the stresses they're in by this very short moment. That short moment of stealth, seeing the tree and nature mattering so much, the different world around you, traveling on the ships, and then the discussion. It all works perfectly together as a bit of a pyramid of narrative. And perhaps you've noticed this, but maybe you haven't. It's this period of quiet right now. You could have killed those guards on the back guard station, but you didn't need to. The game slowly doles out all these options, including here when you're ready to land, not instantly attack. But the game's setting you up with the understanding already that you may or may not do different things to succeed, which later actually becomes the Alliance map's overall mechanisms for taking over. But currently, it's just organically rolled out here in gameplay bit by bit. And doing that also helps gamers feel familiar with what the title's going to ask of them. And it gives them experience to use when the mechanism is later introduced in the game. I like this spot here. It's just one of the better cutscenes in the game. This is one of the more interesting fights at the starting of the game. You've, of course, like I said, you've passed through Norway, you're in England, you see these characters. One of the things the developers had talked about, one of the big difficulties they had, was making sure that the Saxons, the bandits, as well as the more militant groups that they felt different than the Vikings because for a lot of different groups, they can sort of mend into one another. As I said, they like Frank weapons. They also ended up buying shields and armor or bits of supplies from other nationalities. And they put all this together to make themselves 
Vikings. They had no issue stealing and using the items if they were important. So the developers had a bit of difficulty trying to understand exactly how they were going to separate it. And to do so, what they did was a lot of helmet work, a lot of head work, and a lot of differences when it comes to how the characters actually look without the helmets. So some of the overall art styles and maybe less tattooing and stuff like that, which I thought was a really good idea. Now, we jump into combat here. As I said, combat this is going to be hard to do as I'm playing. Combat is a little different in this game than it has been in the others. Again, you have those truncated moments. I do feel that they're noticeable. Ooh, got a little bit of poison there. I do believe that they're noticeable, and they do detract uh, a bit from what I personally wanted in uh, the Vikings game. I was sort of hoping for something a bit more dramatic, a bit more weighty. You still do have some really good cool hits like that. That blood there was awesome. Ooh. I might actually stop this and slow it down so we can talk about combat for a second. Vikings didn't have a defined role when it came to military units, like nations that they may have met on the battlefield. Most of their warriors were trained on a variety of weapons, and their overall functions of the warriors directly reflected the needs of the entire unit based on the core tenant mobility. And that's one of the reasons why you don't hear about Spearman Vikings or Swordman Vikings as much. They were trained and retrained to use all of the weapons, which is what set them apart from the enemies they faced, who may have infantry or cavalry or archers, all of those discrete groups. When discussing animation, while I do have my issues, I do really like that you can see the hit stops on enemies for a lot of the weapons here. The axes and the maces in particular have that gap animation. It's a bit of a stutter that shows impact, like it's catching on a character's body. While a game like, let's say, Vermintide does have that full stop, which makes that combat feel incredibly impactful in first person, a third person game is much more difficult to do that within, especially if you're taking into account enemies, if you have they have the same rules, and are they going to play out in the same ways when it comes to all of the blended animations. There's a lot to take into account there that you may not think of right away. And that's why a lot of games use that sort of motion set where one character will interact with another one, and almost instantly they'll combine into one animation. If you watch closely on the right, you can see that arrow go between the enemy's hand and head. And then this guy just tosses this spear at me. I love that. And that is, again, something that they've added with this system. Slow motion is great. It shows you what really occurred versus what you think. And that's a distinction everybody should know. The special moves the enemies do here are much more defined in slow motion. For example, that blast of sand that guy threw into the opponent's eyes. And then my arrow hit his leg in mid-swing. But the blood splatter comes out the front of the character due to the arrow going all the way through. And his arm whips up. Or my amazing double shot on my own guy. Sorry about that, bro. Boom, bop. My favorite moment, though, is right here. I just saw this when I was doing this. The swing right over the top of her head. And this guy up here swinging that sling and a sling is a weapon that was used by many cultures back then and that ability for it to trace all this these are such a step above all the prior games we had played in last 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 generations to actually see all of this occurring at any one time at this high of fidelity slow motion is a valuable tool if you get a chance throw a game in slow motion after you've recorded a little bit of it during a battle and see you'll probably be very surprised by the variety this is certainly something you can also do during these kind of help assist moves as well as carrying moves to just see how the developers have decided to work the animations in any particular action group or the bow, for instance. Origins, it didn't have larger groups that were raiding in the same way that you see in Valhalla. Odyssey did have some battles. Of, it made sense in many ways because that was within the Peloponnesian War. But Valhalla is a land of just full-blown war many times. And your group is always fully raiding with Vikings. You're always moving out and about. You're always grabbing stuff. You're always having these sectioned off moments where you can see larger and larger scales of enemies. Something that we also see in the assault form in this game. And the idea that they wanted to make sure that they did their best in reflecting that, but at the same time understood that there were some very particular difficulties they were going to run into, especially because this title was built for all consoles, not just the next generation, but the prior generation, as well as PCs with different performance profiles and how they were going to go about this. Honored family, friends, welcome to your Ravensthorpe. They didn't actually know, or at least they said they didn't know consciously, that there was a real Ravensthorpe location that was in the same landmass. It was something that they just came up on their own with. Ravensthorpe, the real one, has indications of a Roman settlement as well as Scandinavians later on, indicating that most likely they took over that larger settlement after the Romans left. But the fact that Ravensthorpe becomes a thing in this game and they didn't actually know about it is just interesting synchronicity when it comes to game development and what you see sometimes with game development. 
also in looking at the village and how Ravensthorpe is set up as a village, it's actually very well done because you are able to walk through the village, you're able to outfit it, decorate it in a way that you really haven't been able to do in some other games. It's not necessarily that you're just upgrading locations. And the game does a very good job continually refreshing those updates. For example, as you're updating the main locations in Ravensthorpe, you also get extensions, including the DLC extensions. When the game senses that you have DLC, they add in a whole new settlement location and tell you about them and tell you that you might want to go see them. It does this cool way of merging everything together when you're in mid-story. You don't have to be in the extended end part of the story, as we've seen in other games. So as you go and you start talking to the characters and you decide to name this location Ravensthorpe, it's just really one of those moments where you're like, wow, that is synchronicity. And it certainly can happen. If somebody's looking looking at a map of America, they're going to see names repeated multiple times. And if they're studying it to create a Viking world, but they're now studying England and Norway, those kind of places, it does make sense that these names will sometimes just sort of come to the forefront and become a thing. And I like that the characters are like, where are we? And she's all an unnamed cops of trees. And they're just like, we can't have it unnamed this entire time. And then again, showing the strength of Eivor as a character where he basically gives his idea of what he wants to name it, and they agree. Once again, showing that the Vikings, that was the way their leadership was done. If they weren't in the middle of battle, if they weren't absolutely under high-stress situations, pretty much people within the room did get to have a say, unless you were one of the very low castes or a slave. I just love this trinity of overall leadership that they have at the starting and understanding, especially Sigmund understanding that, or Sigurd understanding that he could easily just leave his wife behind and have her run everything without any real problems overall, though a couple do creep in here. The leaders themselves were the ones, just like I said at the starting of this, like Captain Kirk, they were jumping inside of a space shuttle and going down to the ground and doing things that a lot of us would be like, should the leader lead from the front or lead from the back? And different nations, of course, handled this differently. But with the Vikings, th these guys are certainly at the forefront. Good work, my dear. So speaking about Viking leaders, I don't know if people know this, but Harold Bluetooth, who is one of the greatest leaders from the Vikings, that's actually how Bluetooth Wireless got its name. The technology would unite devices just like he united tribes. And the logo for, for Bluetooth is actually the initial HB in Bindrune. By the way, Ragnar Lothbrok, that is Shaggy Breaches is pretty much what he was known for. Back then, naming different different nations, different cultures, named their people differently. The Vikings certainly did have more of a over-the-top, a more of a warrior kind of stance for their naming. Other nations at the time had things like Harold the Bald or Harold the Fat, where they would actually name their leaders after their biggest weaknesses. And that shows that difference in cultures that you see. And right there is the bell, not only intoned at different times for religious ceremonies, but it could actually be used to alert the people nearby. As I said, a law, which was that people would come and protect a tribe, protect a, a village, if they could hear the village being attacked, if they could hear bells, if they could hear specific things. And we see that also replicated with the Viking horn. Viking horns can be heard from a great deal of distance away. And if you don't realize that, this is something that the Canary Islands actually have. They have an ancient whistling language and that was used in the 1400s and up and could be heard miles and miles away. And it was a whistling language that be able to transmit information between villages and for very great distances. Horn is sort of a replication of that. It doesn't only stir the blood, but it can inform everybody there that, hey, you're the Vikings have arrived, but also Anybody nearby who heard that could take any orders that they wanted. There isn't really any indication that they were using it for during battles where they would maybe have different signs that they would use, different sounds that they would use. It never really seems to indicate that kind of stuff. But certainly when it comes to it's time to attack or return to the boat, you actually notice that is used in this game. If you listen very closely, while you're in the middle of battles, you actually can hear the secondary horn indicating that all of the men are back at your boat exploring here in the normal places. You also go to Asgard and the game does end up in North America. Why is this? So Ubisoft, especially when the ideas are just blossoming out, they take information and ideas from everybody involved. And this is from the CEO of Ubisoft. The developer lead was with them while they're pitching the idea. They discussed history and some of the first Euro Europeans visiting North America and wondered, 
how that could be, or could it be, worked into the game. The main issue is that Valhalla was set 150 years prior to that happening. The team felt that that location and changeup could be fitting of the story and fit within the Assassins and the Templars' ideals and how the groups affected history. And they were always one step ahead of history anyway. The gameplay cycle completely changes there, with Eivor having to change up his strategies, his tactics, in a way that there's a massive difference from the prior parts of the game, but really elevated the ending story beats in a way that not having it would have probably not done. A frequent complaint is that open world games and a, have a dearth of in-game change. Developers sort of sit on a horde of cyclic game design and mechanics loops, and the worry of changing things outpaces any real desire to change. Like it or not, I think this is one of the best parts of how Valhalla works. Personalization wasn't unknown to the Vikings either. Throughout all their history, when making swords or weapons or shields, they would chisel out this outline of a rune or a picture that they wanted to put on an item into a piece of wood. They'd leave that center empty, then put the metal down on it and hammer hot metal into that outline to etch the blade or roughly meld them. They also believed runes were additive, so if you had two runes on the same blade, technically it was twice as powerful. And their weapons weren't that big either, about three and a half feet for their swords, which were fullered, which is where you take that center groove of steel out. It barely weakens the metal, but it actually ends up making a much lighter weapon. I expected them to be larger for whatever reason, probably just because of fantasy shows. Here, one of the things you find out about the Vikings is that their medals for a long time weren't the best, which is one of the reasons why they were so big on taking Franks, going there, finding weapons from them. What they did was they used a lot of bog metal or bog iron. So bog iron, it's surprisingly from mineral rich water, not from mining of some sort. And you can see this iron bearing groundwater basically typically emerges at a spring and sometimes into some area that has a bit of stagnant water. The chemicals over the top of the water left like an oily sheen from the presence of bacteria mixing in and breaking down some of these materials and the ability for them to go in and they chop off the peat on top they chop off this kind of algae moss and underneath it you'll find little globules little tiny specks of metal that you can actually end up pulling out hammering together to remove as many of the impurities as you want and create your weapons with it. And while this wasn't unknown with other nationalities, other cultures, it was still a really intriguing way for them to outfit themselves in places where possibly there wasn't the ability to put together any really good high quality weapons. Is there a sea skull among you? In the early days of the feud between Kiotve the Cruel and the Raven Clan, there was a mad berserker called Kiar Robo. Kiar had pledged his battle fury to no king or yar and would give his oath back to bog iron. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people believe that the idea of dwarves, the ideas of some people working in darkened locations, hammering this out is actually because to hammer out the impurities, what would happen is they would have a very dark location and the smith was able to look at the iron and identify how many of the impurities they had removed by the color of the iron at any particular temperature. And so the smith was able to look and pull this out. And that's how a lot of these myths of people working in these darkened areas and then over the years become sort of these are dwarves working in the caves. But really, it most likely is simply a replication of what was happening in the back end of all this and how they were getting the impurities from the bog iron, hammering it down, twisting it to do a layered kind of impurity drop where you twist it, you merge these metals together, hammer out the impurities, check the color of the blade, and that's how you end up getting a lot of Viking weapons. Vikings also believed in a thing called sword killing which is where if a person ended up dying, many times they would have swords buried with them, but the Vikings would actually break or bend the swords, indicating that the person was dead and also stopping looting. It was a very smart way of stopping looting. I love the mixture here. Of the, you see the spears, you see all the different hammers. It's definitely crazy, which is something that we see in a lot of the Assassin's Creed. This is going to be hard to fight while I'm talking, but I love the flail, by the way. Flail was not necessarily an incredibly used weapon. You would see more along the lines of maces. Flails were quite difficult and had a very high propensity of injuring the wielder. But to me, I just really like the weapons that remind me a bit of Neo 2 and the Kurosagama. It's just a good weapon to use. I'm going to take this guy. Oh, yep, head's gone. I love it. The mixing in the way that this game handles combat and in the open areas, I think is probably the best that right now Ubisoft can do with the AI that they have. A lot of people look at the AI in these games and say, oh, you know, there's an issue here. It doesn't look very good here. It, this isn't really the greatest way of handling it here. That's completely a very good point. And it's something that 
the devs who work on this absolutely know you can find a bunch of GDC events. I miss that guy. A bunch of GDC events where they discuss how they go about deciding how AI is handled in battles versus handled in uh, exploration, something I've talked about a little bit earlier about the CPU cycles. They're well aware of it. And I think as we see games going to these new, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with this guy. I There we go. Uh, it's one of the things when I come back to do these walk in the walks, I like to come back fresh. And uh, that also indicates that my timing is just absolutely tremendously bad. Tremendously bad. There we go. Wow, that was terrible. Grab your own weapon and stab you to death with it. Especially in this game when I was watching those kind of things and seeing all these stabbing deaths and how characters... Let me take this guy down. How characters interacted with weapons. There's a question that comes up a lot of times in modern military, which is like, why does a Navy SEAL, if they're out of bullets, uh, why don't they just pick up an AK-47? And while in life and death circumstances, at times you will, it's actually funny to find out from a lot of military people that be like, listen, man, you know, I know my weapon and I know what the problems are and I know how it shoots and I know everything. Grabbing an enemy's weapon, you're not 100% a, a, a assured of how it's going to work. And I sort of liked that idea here. Vikings didn't have a problem. Grab that sword, stab somebody through the body with it, and then walk off. Or take it. When it comes to pillaging, which is what we're going to do now, looking around and pillaging, one of the biggest complaints towards Valhalla is that these can feel quite samey. The same complaint that we saw with synchronization that we get in the original games where you had to synchro to be able to see everything. I can't remember how to get up here, but it's on fire, so it's probably going to burn me. And I get that, and I completely understand it. I do think that uh, not only... Oh, that was a bad idea. There we go. <laughs> I'm on fire. Don't worry about me. Quick fire, by the by the way, too. I am just wearing a bunch of uh, a bunch of fur, so I guess I would light on fire quickly. But the idea that they want to go and change some of this stuff with a next gen version, it, it interests me. We'll have to see how they handle it. I do think that they can. I think that there's some spaces here that they could fix up. We know fire again. <laughs> There we go. We do know that this kind of stuff uh, is things that uh, Ubisoft is working on and trying to figure out. Other companies as well. It's not like this didn't happen in Ghost of Tsushima and other games where you'd have weird combat looks. And that game's combat, I, I find incredibly intriguing. I love this design on this. You got, the, of course, the metal rivets there holding that wood together, bracing it. It's quite actually quite a strong door there. I don't know what's going on. I, I thought I was that guy for a second. The, the uh, way the game's camera worked sort of confused me. I do like the designs of all these places. Like I said, the only thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of times there's too much debris where things can look a little weird, look a little bit broken up and not as realistic as I would like. Here we go. Let's open this up. So well, the main complaint people had was, oh yeah, big chest. We know what's going to happen. We're going to open the chest. We're going to get building supplies and we're going to go on. And I get it. I, I certainly do, especially as you continue to play this game. There's a lot of times where you're like, okay, I already know what's happening. There's one more chest. My actual complaint for this game goes towards the hiding of those locations. And in a lot of places, guys, you'll do your, you know, your Odin scent, as I call it, but your Odin sense. And you will notice that one of the places you want to go to is unfortunately, I forgot I could bar that, un unfortunately below the location they're at. And it reminds me of a couple really hard to find tombs that we saw in Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider. And this happens as well in this game, where sometimes you'll look and you'll be like, hey, I want to grab this item, this special item, and it'll be underground. And you're like, oh, God, I got to sit for like 15, 20 minutes and find this because it's going to be an assassin's a piece of armor or something good. Not necessarily in love with it. One thing we don't see here, which was a big deal with the Vikings, is they would definitely go and they would do, they hugely believed in ransom. That ransom of people from a monastery was a big deal, villagers, what have you. They would most likely be sold into slavery. Uh, they had no, I love that move. They had no issues whatsoever with taking, you know, monks from a monastery and ransoming them. And it actually worked out quite well. There's a lot of the kings that were in charge in different areas would always feel like they had to save those people that they had to pay them, which goes again towards Dane coin, all of the money that they basically gave away to stop them from attacking for small periods of time. Now, this one goes underneath, and finding the, the spot underneath is very difficult. The developers have talked multiple times when they were creating games, they were, especially the ones I found were Syndicate, Origin, and Odyssey, because Valhalla still doesn't have 
any real, a ton of GDC content. Most likely we'll be seeing that next year. But when you look at how they created locations, they were aware that there were issues there. They were aware that, uh, you know, sometimes it could be difficult to find, but they did feel that it would be more interesting for a player if that's what they wanted to do. I love this location here. It's just, it's really cool. Even though some of these bits that you see are a little bit off kilter and you're like, why would that just be sitting out here? It does break up the, the vision and make it seem more interesting. And I think that works. I have no issues with that. You'll see a couple things that look a little bit weird and where you're like, dude, these guys are just leaving their food out and you know, their expensive food. This is something that we see in a lot of games though. I, I, I think every single game, including Witcher 3, which for a lot of people is their top tier title when it comes to how it handles its fantasy world. Grab that. I love walking back to the boat after a good long job where you've taken everybody out. As I stated before, the Vikings didn't have necessarily particularly trained people in like a spearman group or something like that. They were all expected to pretty much know everything. One of the things that I do like, and you find this written about in a lot of histories, is that they were very well trained on subverting the expectations of those they fought, including pincer movements and flanking, which is completely normal and everybody would assume, but they also did things that a lot of other groups would not do, including pretending that they were all dead to get people near them. They also had a high degree of mobility. We talked about, especially with their boats, their ability to move and attack another location was far beyond the ability of a horse or somebody to deliver a message, even multiple horses in a row. Oh, what is that? A snake? I think... Yeah, that's a snake. I'm stuck on him. I'm stuck on the snake. Come on. And off. I always found that weird that a bunch of snakes were, I don't know, maybe I haven't really tracked. I don't think England has giant poisonous snakes, but maybe they do. I like this. Everybody's just dead in here under tarps. This was a monastery right prior to me going there. That was a, a, just a bunch of people dead in there. Like no villager would have been like, dude, we need to get rid of them. Of course, as we know, there were various different illnesses and stuff like that that were occurring at the same time as the Vikings were attacking there, we, we see that in multiple histories, plagues were happening and stuff like that, smaller ones than the great plagues, but it's still, it's just a little funny to see all those dead bodies in there. Every time an Assassin's Creed game comes out, we often joke about the inevitable assassin who can climb everything, part monkey, part glue stick with swords. Nevertheless, with the Vikings, there are a number of tales of them forging across forests and right up over peaks, especially with their mythology so close to them, being so close to them that feeling that they can reach out and touch the gods, the Aurora Borealis is what they thought was absolutely a god pulling across the sky at night. They most likely used a lot of the same techniques that a lot of other groups at this time would be using. The smart climber climbed up with almost nothing but a rope and then used the rope to pull up belongings even to spots along the climb. It could be a crevice or a nest or any small space that they could lodge it in, even if they were doing that once every 50 or 60 feet, it's a lot better than having that on you as you climbed up an area. And this would happen not only in full sheer climbs that we see, which is probably a lot less likely, but also just very hard treks where it was impossible to make sure that you could get your hand held and you wanted to maybe not fall and drop all of your supplies at the same time. When the developers go on their tours, they always bring the information that they have with them and that sort of gets adjusted as they go out and they start to see exactly how the whoops, <laughs> exactly how the world works. And they assumed a lot of different expectations that didn't come out. For example, as the developers took their trip to gather this photos and this inspiration for art and recordings, many of them began to realize that they had all sort of picked up on something and they came together as a group and it started being discussed. And that's that the feeling of community was quite high. The idea that not only everyone, but every single thing that people made was built by the community, literally everything, but also that every rope, every part of someone else, every bit that they wore out into the field was built by the group. And the developers had a moment where they realized, you know, this rope is made by somebody. Of course it was, but one part and one fact of many that can be forgotten when you are just looking at an item. If you were a warrior, let's say in another group, you may just be like, where's the rope? Instead of looking at that rope and maybe having a memory tied to it. And this is also a good point that the more westernized military units that the Vikings had faced off against prior and throughout this time, much of that work might be done by someone unattached, someone not known. And it's hard to argue that at the very least, there might be some kind of feeling of uh, responsibility and weight there. Boat building was the same way. Remember boat building, no written origin to boat building. It was 100% spoken notes and steps that worked for them prior. I always enjoy coming back to a spot like this, that feeling that I got in Primal, Far Cry Primal, one of the first games where I really got this feeling. 
that coming back to your base and seeing that base change around you, whether actively or passively when you made these decisions. I'm going to build a blacksmith here, I think. I think I'm, yeah, build a blacksmith here. There's just a nice feeling of solidarity, and this is actually what colored all of the quest giving in this game. Solidarity and community. It's two reasons that the quests and events are set up the way they are in Valhalla. The very early stage, very early point when making the game, the developers decided that most quests would start and stop within or near the village, and that random guys wouldn't be walking around giving you three stage quests under a rock somewhere, and that, that would just be a very, very rare thing. Now, why is that? Well, because it would feel weird if a bunch of people were tasking a Viking to go and do a bunch of work. That just doesn't make any sense. And we talked about it in the other Walk in the Walk videos many times. The idea that a protagonist on a great adventure would be stopped or unrecognizable enough that he would be stopped every four seconds to find someone's dropped loaf of bread doesn't make a lot of sense. And what it does is it actually pulls you out of the great encounter. It doesn't mean you can't have it once or twice, but most games, just look at the games you're playing now, most games build their entire quest structure around a multitude of these, not one or two, not even three or four, but many times hundreds of them. People come into Eivor's camp, on the other hand, is a completely different situation. They enter his camp, and yes, this works perfectly to sell a little bit to the player. That means when Eivor takes on a, a quest, it's because it matters if he chose to do so. It also means he has a responsibility as the person tasking and asking to get it done, because most likely those people are now in camp asking for him to do so. And it sells responsibility to the player in a passive way that's not required at all times to be active, but is at all times just there, just enough for a player who cares to actually realize it. But the big question is going to be, what if the player doesn't care? That's a problem too. So you get all those quests returning and starting here. Now that does have an issue where a lot of people felt it was a little bit, uh, let's say loopy, where you started to do it and you started to sort of feel that quest loop start up. Since it hits on the realism of what might happen and a Viking probably isn't being tasked all the time by random people in the streets, I'm okay with that. Hi, them. Now that you and Basim are settled, what will you do? We have work to do, starting in the cities of England. London, Jorvik, Winchester, all three are infested by members of the same order to which Kyotve belonged. But the reach of Environmental storytelling is simply the telling of something visually of an occurrence in the past or of something occurring around you. And that is, at its very basic, correct. But what happens in this game is that the environmental storytelling is also what you've built. And I think that that's something important and should be recognized, that when you're bringing in some of these locations and building them up, unlocks quests that really you can skip. If you don't have that, helps in aiding the environmental storytelling. A lot of people will say, oh, it's visual information to the game player. It's just, it's much more than that. We've saw this done excellently in Witcher 3, where, for example, I, there was erosion patterns in the terrain, and I talked about that in mine, where you could see it was this feeling of time had passed, and you almost felt like the, the cities in those locations were tied into this older location, and they felt older at those parts. That doesn't always have to be what you get. We certainly see that here where the entire location is completely different than Norway, where you drop in and vast prairies that happens. But with the environmental storytelling, the ability for you to inject your own storytelling into it is really helpful to see those changes. The statues that we see that you guys can erect for Odin and other gods is very cool. And it allows for you to pass by the sense, uh, sense of time and sense of well-spent resources that you sort of get from the environmental storytelling they built in. And while yes, this is different than let's say what we saw just a bit ago where you're walking through a location, there's a you know mausoleum, you open up the door and there's just dead bodies there. That's one kind of environmental storytelling, right? It for sure is. But there's really four kinds. There's time-based storytelling, and that's your storytelling that really exists, time-based environmental storytelling, where it really does exist to give you a feeling of the world existing prior to you getting there. That would be those bodies, right? It hits, you're like, okay, I get it, everything makes sense. And that's where I'm going to end this one, because in the next video, I'll talk about other types of environmental storytelling or types that I think should be involved in the discussion at the very least. If you like these, I would love for you to spread the word about them wherever you can. Reddit, Facebook, Twitter. These are something that I love to do, but I really do need them to be spread around as much as possible. If you enjoy it, post that in the comments. If you didn't enjoy it, post that in the comments. Give it a thumbs up, like, what have you. Jump to the patron if you want to help me continue to make videos like this as well as reviews that aren't filled with two minutes of sponsored bullshit. Peace out and see you on chapter three.